Um, so Jesus used uh, the example of the um, mustard seed on on three occasions through the Gospels. He used it in Luke chapter 17, verse 6. And he said, having faith like a grain of mustard seed, one would be able to say to this tree, be uprooted and be, um, be removed. Um, he then said in Matthew 17, verse 6, six if you, sorry, Matthew 17, verse 20, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you'd be able to say to these mountains, be removed and cast into the sea. And then he, in Matthew 13, he talked about the parable of the mustard seed and he talks about um, life being nourished in the mustard seed. So birds take refuge in the mustard plants and come and rest there. And in these three examples, it's really about the teaching of the gospel that you know, if you looked at trees being uprooted, he's talking about oppositions being defeated. You talked about mountains being moved, he's talking about sin being overcome. And if you talk about birds taking refuge, he's talking about a nourished life, a life um, within the beauty of the principles and teachings of the gospel. That is the essence of the gospel. Every, every opposition defeated, every mountain removed, and a place, a sanctuary for all the birds of the year. Um, and and it was, it's remarkable because I believe that it's perhaps the greatest sign that we have, and it probably indicates to us that we really are at the time of the end, and um, the promise of the fact that um, Jesus is very much at the door. Um, because in the Olivet Prophecy, um, Jesus talked about various signs of the end. The disciples asked him, when shall the end be and what shall be the sign of your coming? And Jesus listed a number of things, including earthquakes, famines and pestilences, which I guess you could see coronavirus in that light. But, but in enlisting wars and earthquakes and pestilences and famines, he then went on to say, and the end shall not yet come. So almost as though those things were expected to come, they will be there, but they're not really the true trigger sign. And if you wanna see the trigger sign, it's the story of the mustard seed, because in Matthew 24, he says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And really what we've witnessed in the last 2000 years is the moving of that mustard seed to all the earth. And the video that I wanted to show yesterday that I didn't, uh, for some reason my computer wasn't working and hopefully it'll work now because I turned it off and turned it on and everything comes right. So there's the, there's the key. When everything's wrong, turn your computer off and start again and everything comes right. It's amazing. So hopefully this will work. In this video, this is actually showing the spread of Christianity. Those that followed, you know, the teachings of Jesus from the time of Jesus when when his disciples began to follow him, and it, and it tracks from sort of uh, AD 20, and it follows through Christianity in the Roman Empire. Now, as you see this video, it only lasts a minute or two. It's a good sort of graphic illustration of history and you'll see um, empires coming and going in the background and um, different religions are waxing and waning in the background. And there'll be times when you'll see Christianity or, or the gospel as, as it were, um, you know, it expands and then it contracts and all sorts of reasons happen for that, you know, over persecution, the time of the Black Plague is in there, which is interesting. But then you'll see what happens as we come to our generation. And it's quite remarkable because I think we're witnessing really the greatest sign that Jesus is at the door. So here's hoping this works.
<laughs> so um, I, I think that video representation is just an incredible representation. It takes you to 2015 and, um, and uh, even since 2015, in the last five years, the gospel was stretching further and further. And, and it's been remarkable to see, you know, like um, the word uh, and the teaching of Jesus reach into, you know, the furthest places into Russia. And as, as I mentioned to you, you know, my, my good friend Carl is currently in, in Finland preaching the gospel. And so truly the gospel has been preached to the four corners of the earth and the name of Jesus right now um, has been great. And, it, and it's been great through the entire world. And I think this is the sign of the fact the end shall come, which is why I think us now in our little bubbles, enjoying this time together is an opportunity. It's probably a great warning for us because there's a possibility as we come out of the bubble, the whole um, consumerism machine starts up again. And I think many of us might have been on that treadmill. I know in my life I've been, you know, struggled with, you know, the materialistic age we live in. And this opportunity that we're given to come away, to shut the doors about us and just to get out of it, to move off the treadmill and to take time to reflect on what we value because all the sporting idols have come down, the materialistic consumer um, things have come down, the fashion world's come down, and it's like, okay, it's time to sit back and think what are the true values in life because people are spending time in their, with their families and hopefully spending time with God. So this is a great opportunity to, um, to spend time, to meditate, to think about others, and hopefully if we do come out of this, to not get on that treadmill again. So we finished last night, we looked um, at this quote here. And, um, and I, I mentioned last night that I think that we, we're very familiar with this quote because it's used a lot um, in regards to baptism. And um, for those who weren't here, I, I just explained my little slide. I thought it was a great little slide of the turtle coming out of the water, coming out of his shell, and um, and the light is shining on the face of the turtle. And, and it's a brilliant little picture because it, it symbolizes what baptism is all about. So we quote this quote a lot in um, Numbers chapter 6, um, verse 24 to 26. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. Be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. What we don't do, sadly, is we don't often cite the next verse, which I think is an absolute critical verse, verse 27 of Numbers chapter 6, which says, and so shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. So this uh, blessing that we quote is actually the putting on of the name of God. Everything in this blessing encapsulates what the name of God really is. When we talk about the name of God and, and we don't want to do a treatise on, on the name, although it's quite amazing if we were to, to look at the actual Hebrew of the name Yahweh, we could talk a lot about it. Um, but within that name, of course, it's a promise. Um, behind the name Yahweh is the idea of I will be or I am becoming. It's a covenant promise of what God is going to do. So what is he going to do? What is the promise? Well, Numbers chapter 6 is what this promise is. And what I hope to show is that in this blessing, the Lord bless thee and keep thee, the Lord make his face to shine upon thee, be gracious, lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace, is the name of Jesus. It is the name above every name. It is outworked in the name of Jesus Christ and the end thereof is peace. The total goal at the end of all of this is peace or what we might say unity. So here's 
how I'd like to look at um, this blessing. There's four parts to it. The Lord bless thee, make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious to you, to lift up his countenance upon you and to give you peace. So this is how I would see that this breaks down. The first part about blessing and keeping, and we're going to look at that in this talk today, is about instruction. And you might say it's a little bit about the law. Making his face to shine upon you is about transformation and obviously about grace to be gracious unto you. So there's a move from instruction or law into transformation and grace. The law through Moses came, but grace came through Jesus Christ. The lifting up of his countenance is about exaltation. It's about the end of the law, which is love. Lifting up his countenance is seeing what truly that transformation leads to. And finally, the end of all of this is about unity, peace. And as we, we said, you know, in our talk yesterday, when you look at the things that God named in the garden, God only names like things or calls them by name, and he separated all of those things, but he separated those things and gave them a name to identify that which he had a purpose with. So he separated light from darkness because his purpose was with light. He separated the firmament below from the firmament above because he has a purpose with a heavenly calling. He separated the land out of the sea because he has a purpose of separating the people to himself. And the one thing that is um, kind of missed in that Genesis record is that when you come to Genesis 5, we discover that the only other thing he named was he named Adam and Eve and he called them Adam. He made man and woman and called them Adam, which is interesting. God originally made them male and female and there was no distinction. They were given a singular name. So that's very important. The end of God's purpose is peace and unity. And we're going to see that in Jesus Christ. So, so in this session, we're going to talk about that first part, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. In this, in this context of the Lord bless thee, the, the Hebrew word for bless um, comes from a root meaning to kneel or to prostrate oneself, um, which is, which is um an interesting concept. We can kind of understand that when we see a person kneeling and prostrating themselves before the Lord, seeking the Lord. And perhaps the best illustration I can give of how this word is used in terms of the Lord bless thee is in the story of Solomon. So after they brought the ark back up into Jerusalem and set it in the temple, it says that Solomon finished offering all his prayers and his plea to the Lord, and he arose from the altar of the Lord where he knelt with his hands outstretched from heaven. And then he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice. Now, this is the true symbol of the priestly mediator work, that which has been referred to in Numbers chapter 6, because remember, Numbers chapter 6 was the blessing on the children of Aaron. And so here you can see Solomon. He goes to God and he kneels down before God, prostrate, kneels before him. And on behalf of all the people, he's asking God, um, Lord, if we are good, if we do all of these things and we do what you've told us to do and we behave ourselves, will you bless us? Will you hear us from heaven, your dwelling place? And he lists all the things that they ought to be doing in being obedient to God's commandment. Then he stands and turns around and he blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice. 
And so this is now passing on God's blessing. It's as though God has heard the petition, and now the blessings are falling from God upon the people, that God will hear this petition and he will show compassion and love and mercy towards the people. So that, that's, a, that's a good illustration of the word bless in the sense of the word kneel. The, I guess the tricky thing is, is when you think about God blessing the people, you don't necessarily think about God kneeling before the people. Um, until we get to a wonderful picture of the New Testament, and I think uh, this illustration perhaps is the best illustration of how this mutual blessing occurs. So this one we know well. So here's a picture of Mary in the house of Jesus at his feet, and she's anointing Jesus with her hair. And she has blessing, as it were, Jesus in, in her prostrate move before him and anointing him for his burial. Um, of course, uh, some were a bit indignant about this behavior. That's John 12. The very next chapter, we find Jesus prostrating and kneeling before the disciples. When he washed their feet, he put on his outer garments, he resumed to his place, and he says, do you understand what I have done to you? Now, here's the key in what he's done. You call me teacher and Lord, and so I am. And in this story of the Lord bless thee and keep thee, it's about God providing instruction, guidance, for people to walk and, and to govern their lives. And, and this picture of Jesus kneeling before his disciples is like God blessing people. God comes down. You know, here's this remarkable quote, Isaiah 66 verse two. It says, but to this is the one to whom I will look, to him that is of a humble and contrite spirit and one that trembles at my word. And so in Isaiah 66, he says, you know, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool, but I will come and dwell with him that is of a poor and contrite spirit. So God is coming down and blessing his people. And you see this in the symbol of Jesus before the disciples, kneeling to serve them and then instruct them and say, you know, I am your Lord and teacher. By the way, it's one of the things that, you know, in terms of our relationship with Jesus, I think I think we ought to always remember that in terms of our relationship with Jesus. Um, Jesus said to his disciples, you call me Lord and master and you do well because so I am. So just remember that when you're thinking about your personal relationship with Jesus. He is, you know, our close friend, but he is definitely our Lord and Master. And between those two titles, Lord and Master, is both Lord in the sense of Adonai, um, a ruler, and Master in the sense of teacher or educator. So coming back to this quote. Here's the quote, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. So there's the first part of the quote, the Lord bless thee. And, and in this quote, it has the idea of God providing a divine blessing. It comes from God. Every resource that God can give to help, he is going to give. He, it's going to come from heaven. And it's seen in that symbol of Jesus before the disciples' feet. The blessing will come from God upon us. And the word keep there is the word which the Jews use a lot called Shema. Um, so in, in the idea of Shema, it means to hedge about and protect. So uh, to kind of set up a wall, if you like, to protect within within confines. Now, this is what you do with a child. 
you know, child lo children love to live by boundaries. This why well, this is why it says the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Um, and in this first part of the blessing, it is really talking about law. Um, and you get these quotes here: train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. So, you know, this is instruction that you give to children to keep them in the way. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. God's intention is to provide us and help us to stay on the right path, to keep us in the way. Um, the problem is with kids, um, you know, some of them like discipline, some of them don't. Some of them respond well to instruction, some of them don't. And that's why the proverb says, train up a child in his way. In other words, not all children are the same and the same type of instruction or discipline is not gonna work for everybody. The disciples were very different and Jesus treated them quite differently in terms of teaching them. Um, and this quote here, uh, and actually we were with um, Robert this morning and we talked a lot about this example in Proverbs about you know a wise man hears instruction a wise man listens to instruction a wise man learns from instruction so this proverb says look a righteous man falls seven times and rises again but a wicked falls to his calamity and the difference between the wise man and the wicked man here is that you know this is what you would call resilience so the wise man when he falls and makes a mistake, he learns from it. He gets back up again. When he is told off, he learns from that scolding, as it were. A child learns from the scolding that he's being told off. But not everybody is like that. The wicked fall to their calamity. And, and it's interesting in this event that happened in John 12 and 13, the two events which really show the symbol of God's blessing is the total, uh, the total contrast between um, Judas Iscariot and Jesus. Because in this event, in John chapter 12, you'll find that um, it's the only record of Jesus rebuking Judas. So, Judas is rebuked in this chapter, John 12, verse 4, because Judas is, of course, indignant over the waste of Mary wasting this on Jesus. Mark 14 says immediately after this, Mark 14, verse 10, immediately after this, Judas went out and betrayed Jesus. So remember the proverb, a wise man falls seven times and gets back up again, but the wicked will fall to his own destruction. And that's what happened. The end result of this was that immediately after this rebuke, Judas couldn't cope with it. He got told off, he got publicly censured, he didn't like getting publicly censured by Jesus, and the end result was he fell to headlong to his own destruction. Now, there is a stark contrast with that to Peter, because in the example of Peter, Jesus rebukes Peter in the very next chapter. In fact, if you look at the story of Peter, you'll find that he's rebuked seven times by Jesus, and he keeps getting back up again. So it's not that he made, didn't make any mistakes, Peter made lots of mistakes but he was wise in the sense that he listened to Jesus as a wonderful counselor. So herein as our, uh, our example of Jesus in the first part of this blessing that we found in the, in the uh, Numbers chapter six, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. And what I'd like to suggest to you is this is equivalent to the first part of Jesus' name in Isaiah chapter nine. So just come and have a look at Isaiah chapter nine. Um, 
maybe a quick background to Isaiah chapter 9. I wouldn't want to get into the background of this too deep, otherwise we will be here to the end of the lockdown. It uh, tends to be one of my favourite subjects. So um, Isaiah chapter 9 is the story, of course, of the birth uh, or, or pointing forward to the promise of the birth of Jesus. It sits in the middle of what's known as the Emmanuel prophecies. So the Emmanuel prophecies start in chapter 7 and finish in chapter 12. And, and what the Emmanuel prophecy is all about is, is Israel was at a time when they were very much divided between the northern and southern kingdom. In fact, they were almost about to go to civil war. So the northern kingdom of um, Ephraim had joined an alliance with Syria. And you can hardly imagine a situation where you know, the kingdom of Israel was so divided that they had made an agreement and forged an alliance with one of God's arch enemies, the Syrians, and were going to invade and attack Judah. And their plan was very simple. They wanted to overthrow the kingdom of David, the house of David, the lineage of David, and they wanted to depose the then king, who was probably just a boy waiting to be king, Ahaz, and they wanted to set up their own new line to the throne. They wanted to set up a puppet king and take control of the southern kingdom. And in this story, it was like God came to Ahaz to offer Ahaz an opportunity to trust in his counsel, in his advice. And he says, look, Ahaz, if you trust in me, this is all in chapter seven, he says, I can deliver you. Take my advice, Ahaz, take my counsel. And Ahaz refused it. And so God said, look, Ahaz, if you're not sure, he says, I will prove it to me. Ask anything in heaven above and I'll prove it by a wonder or a sign. Now, the word wonderful from the word wonderful counselor has the idea of a sign or a miracle or a power. So this is a, so this is a miracle advisor, if you like. And that's what God had just offered to Ahaz. Ahaz turned around and says, no, I don't want, I don't want that. So then God says, well, you don't want that. He says, well, God's going to show you a wonderful sign. A virgin will conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. So the promise of Emmanuel or the coming of Messiah was in fulfillment of Ahaz, Ahaz's reflection refusal to accept God's counsel. So now when you come to chapter 9, it's talking about um, the northern kingdom of Israel who were in utter darkness, the area of course where Jesus was born uh, or was raised, should I say, in Nazareth, up around northern Galilee, all of that area, Galilee, it says of the nations, verse one, are going to see an incredible light. And obviously this points forward to the time of, of Jesus, where up around that area, they were to be privileged to have in their midst the, uh, the sun, which was promised way back in the time of Ahaz, where the virgin will conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. But What's behind this name, Emmanuel, this name above every name? Well, it comes in verse six. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called. And here's his name, and it divides into four. Some translations read, it like it divides into five. Some translations will read his name is called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But you'll notice that if you really break this down, it's very clear in the Hebrew that there is an adjective and a noun put together, a describing word compounded with a noun. So if you look at Mighty God, Mighty, powerful is the adjective. God is the noun. Everlasting Father, an adjective describing God's 
eternal, uh, eternal character. Prince of peace or peaceful prince is the noun and the adjective. So the first part, wonderful counselor, is the adjective and the noun. So this should be reading, his name shall be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that that is the name of God. And it is the very name which the children of Aaron were to pronounce upon the nation of Israel when they said, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee. And the Lord give thee peace are the four aspects of God's name which represents of who he will be, what he intends to do. And that's why the next verse in Numbers chapter 6 says, and so shall you put my name upon the children of Israel. So when you look at the story of Jesus and you see him, he truly is the wonderful counsellor. And um, what does it mean to be the wonderful counsellor. Well, here's a great story um, from John chapter four with the woman of woman of Samaria. So in John chapter four, the woman of Samaria, which again is a remarkable um, connection back into our story of Isaiah, because if you look to the background story of Isaiah, it was Samaria or the Northern Kingdom who had set themselves in opposition against Judah and civil war between the North and South had broken out. And ever since that time, the Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. They hated the Samaritans, but Jesus went out of his way to provide counsel and instruction for this woman. In fact, he went and searched for her and it says the woman said to jesus i know that when messiah is coming who is called the christ when he comes he will tell us all things and jesus said to her i who speak to you am he he's the wonderful counselor uh, and um he he was able to give counsel and wisdom and advice and he did so to all. He wasn't discriminant in terms of who he did it to. Now, what we're also going to look at in this title in Isaiah 9, as we look closer at the breakup of this title, these titles, is that all of these titles were uh, titles which were actually given to either uh, special angels or to the great man Abraham. Let me explain that quickly. So we'll we'll look at the first one in a second. Um, but you'll see the second one, mighty God. In the Hebrew, that is El Gibor, from where we get Gabriel from, one of one of the mighty angels. So we know Gabriel. The last title, Peaceful Prince is where you get the title Michael from, the Prince of God. And remember of Michael, it's, it says at that time, this is Daniel 12, shall Michael the great prince, that stands for your children of the people stand up. So Michael, the Prince of God, bore that title. Um, the title Everlasting Father, was a title the Jews had for Abraham all the time. Um, and you'll see that in the New Testament in John chapter 8, where Jesus said to the Jews, "Think, no, say not to yourselves that you have Abraham as your father. Before Abraham was, I am, which we'll look at that later. But the title everlasting father, Abraham, of course, was called the father of the nations, the father of the Jews. And God promised them that he'd be a father of all nations. So the everlasting father was a title the Jews gave to Abraham. Wonderful counselor is again actually the title of another angel, which we'll look at in a, in a minute. So in this, you have 
the great father of the nation, Abraham, and all the mighty, mighty angels are listed there. And when you come to Hebrews, it says of Jesus, he's given a name above every name. He's given a name above the angels. He was made a little lower than the angels, but now he's been crowned with glory and honor above the angels. So in this, these four titles, it's actually showing Jesus' superiority over all the great angels that have been at God's side and even over Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, and it's showing his name above every name. So let's look quickly at this first one, Wonderful Counselor, and see again where this appears in the biblical record. So the story comes in Judges where we have the story of the birth of Samson. Now here's the parallel to our story with Emmanuel and with the birth of Jesus is that when you come to the story of Judges, Mrs. Manoah, we don't know her name, was barren and could not have children. And you'll find in Judges chapter 13 that an angel came to her and said a miracle was going to happen. I'm going to give a wonder and you shall have a child, which of course would have been very exciting news, which is the same wonderful news that was given to many of the faithful uh, women in Israel. And God gave her specific instructions about the raising of the child, instructions about how to bring up the child, and instructions about her own life and what she must do. And in Judges 13 verse 14, it says, all that I command you, or all that I command the woman, by the way, the angel's here in, in verse 14 talking to Manoah. So he talks to Manoah and he says, look, all that I command the woman, let her observe. Now, interesting thing here, that word observe, that's the very word for the Lord bless thee and keep thee. It's the word Shema. It's where the, the whole idea of the law is based. So this is an instruction about a way of life, how to conduct herself. Then it says, the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, because Manoah said to the angel, what's your name that I may, we may do honor to you? And God, uh, the angel responded and said, why do you ask my name seeing it is wonderful? And that's the very uh, root word, or almost exactly, well, it pretty much is exactly the same word as the word which is used for wonderful counselor. It's just basically the, uh, the tense of the word that changes. So one's like a pronoun and one's like a, an adjective. Um, so it says, why do you ask my name seeing it is wonderful? And then almost to add emphasis to that in verse 19 of Judges, it said, and so uh, they offered an offering to the Lord on the rock, and it says, uh, to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. So in this whole uh, appearance in this story is a wonderful counselor. It's a divine blessing. It comes from God out of heaven. It's a miracle. And it's an instruction about a way of life. This is God's counselor, the wonderful counselor. Now, um, of course, if you read the rest of the record of uh, Judges chapter 13, the angel ascends in the fire and Manoah is just absolutely gobsmacked as this picture shows. His mouth drops and he's never seen anything quite like it. He suddenly realizes he's been talking to a divine being. 
maybe he wasn't quite certain it was an angel, wasn't quite certain who this person was, but by the end of this, when the angel ascended up in the fire, what an incredible symbol, when the angel ascended up in the fire, he realized at that moment that he was talking to a divine being. And that caused them to be absolutely terrified and say, we're going to die. We're going to die. We are going to die because we've seen God. Mrs. Manoa, as sound as she was, because she was probably the, um, the, the sensible one in all of this. In fact, she was specifically the one that was given the instructions, not Manoa. She turned around to Manoa and said the most logical thing. And this is really important for our subject. She said, no, we aren't going to die. In fact, let me let me find it because I think we should read it. Um, Judges chapter 13. Um, in verse 23, Manoah, or verse 22, Manoah said to his wife, we're going to die for we've seen God. And his wife said to him, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted our burnt offering and our grain offerings at our hands or shown us all these things or announced such things. See the wonderful counselor? Shown us all these things and instructed us in the way. Now she sees far more than Manoah sees. What Manoah sees is just the awesome power of God and it's so terrifying, he thinks he's going to die. What she sees is she sees the awesome power of God, but she sees it as a blessing. She sees it as something that's been given to her and that God has received from her. So she sees past the power and sees the purpose. And she obviously sees the, uh, the wisdom of instruction. So in, that, in the idea of the wonderful counselor, Jesus for us is the one that helps to keep us in the way. As the law was the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Now let's see if I can give you an illustration of how Jesus does this in a far more powerful way than the law ever did. When you consider the law, God took a multitude out of the nations. He took a nation and he brought them out into the desert and he took them on a journey, a huge multitude into the middle of the desert. And it was scary because they left their homes, they left their protection, they left an environment where for many years under Joseph, they had a lot of security and he took them out into the wilderness and now it was terrifying because they were in a strange environment and around them, of course, in the wilderness, there's all sorts of dangers. But God gave them laws by means to protect them, instruction, uh, uh, to instruct them, and to keep them on that journey. Now, if you like, it's a bit like this. So this is the Great Wall of China. And it's in the middle of like a wilderness. You see all around them is a wilderness. And you've got a great multitude of people, and they're walking around that wall and around the wall, they are hedged about. You see, the wall is a lot higher to protect them. That's what the idea of the word keep or to observe or shamar is. Now, in that group of people, when God gave his law to Israel, staying inside that wall did not make them righteous did not change them at all. Keeping the law did not change them, did not make them righteous. And, and here's the situation, see the people at the front of that picture, they're looking over the wall and they're looking down. And you know what they're, they're saying, aren't you? You can see what they're saying. They're like, I'm the king of the castle and you're the dirty rascal. Well, funny enough, that's actually kind of the way is 